Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to What I Tell My Patients. As today, we begin a 10-part series that will conclude on Saturday afternoon, focusing on new developments in medical oncology and gynecologic oncology and urologic oncology and what we say to our patients about these new developments. We're starting out talking about cervical and endometrial cancer. We have a great faculty. All of these meetings have the same exact format. Uh, and for really, we envision this as an integrated 10-part, uh, 16-hour experience. Uh, for those of your colleagues who aren't here today or if you miss any of these programs, we'll, we'll be uh, posting these as video and audio online for you to utilize over the ensuing few months. We've been, uh, this is the 15th year we've been coming to the ONS meeting and uh, uh, doing this sort of parallel uh, series of symposia. We work with the hundreds of faculty over these last 15 years, and really that's what we're here today to, to do is to bring these people to you and to ask them the questions that I think you uh, want to know about in terms of what's going on today in the treatment of cancer. Here are the 10 programs that we're going to be doing all in this room tonight. We'll be talking about breast cancer. Um, here's our faculty today. Uh, we have two uh, nurse practitioners and two uh, physicians. Mike is a medical oncologist. Brian is a gynecologic oncologist. Um, but we'll, over the next uh, few days, we'll be working with 44 uh, faculty that are coming here to San Antonio, picking their brains, uh, asking them about their ex clinical experiences, basically learning as much as we can from these people over the next uh, few days. And it's a real privilege to be working uh, with uh, this group of people as we uh, do every year. We've always patterned our work around rounds. We tend to minimize the slides. We know a lot of people end up listening to our programs, our live programs, while they're driving or working out. So we tend to un we talk more and use less slides and really bring in some of the more modern developments uh, really, this, uh, the faculty for all these meetings really is, uh, represents part of the key triad in oncology in terms of decision-making and taking care of patients, the physician, the nurse, and the patient and their loved ones. These are the themes that we've really had in these uh, meetings over the years. Uh, first, our main emphasis here is to update many things that are going on in uh, cancer treatment. It seems like almost every day a new agent is approved. It is very, very challenging for physicians to keep up to date for all oncology clinicians. We're gonna to try to update you as effectively as we can so you can let your patients know what's going on and maybe what's gonna be happening over the next couple of years. In particular, we talk a lot about what you say to patients, talking to patients, and particularly trying to bring patients up to speed on new therapies, that, you know, maybe new agents, new treatments. That'll be uh, another important theme that comes out of the cases. We've had the theme of the bond that heals for many years, the idea that even in situations where you really can't provide something effective to you know, attack the cancer, you provide your relationship with the patient, and the patient values that a lot, and really there's a lot of healing power to that. Last year, we kind of added a new theme that sort of popped up as we were chatting along the, the way, which is really to take a breath and just say, you are doing an amazing job oncology, nursing, the value that you provide to your patients is amazing. You just have to ask your patients and family, but you know, thanks to you and great job. That theme will be reinforced and the bond that heal as we talk about patients, but uh, people value what you do tremendously. Another theme we're gonna talk about is the biopsychosocial model of looking at a patient and figuring out why is it different to take care of a patient like this than another person who has the same cancer situation, but is a different person. Different comorbidities, age, attitude, socioeconomic status, language, et cetera. And in particular, how do you adjust the way you do patient education based on the individual characteristics? Everybody always asks for the music we play. You know, we, we have great speakers uh, here, so we take advantage, have a little mini concert. Uh, we've kind of really playing the same songs the last 15 years, actually, hopefully. Uh, you all like this, but uh, if you go to re uh, Spotify, researcherpractice.com slash ONS23 playlist, you, know, you get the music I like, and I think the music actually reflects the pace that we're going to be going here today. You know, we'll end up with little Foo Fighters at the end on Saturday as well. 
But uh, let's jump into our first topic, uh, cancer of the cervix and endometrium. And uh, as we do in all these meetings, when we introduce the faculty, you give them just a few seconds to tell us a little bit about themselves. I said, anything you want to say about yourself, what you do to get away from oncology, what you like to do in your spare time, things that happen at work that are funny, whatever you want to talk about. Brian uh, Slamovitz, uh, you're in Miami with us here at Research to Practice. Uh, I think a leadership role in terms of gynecologic oncology. What do you like to do to get away from things, Brian? Yeah, hey, thanks, uh, Neil. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, you know, my, my, my hobby, my focus is my kids. So uh, whatever they want to do, um, whether I like it or not. Last week we uh, <laughs> trekked along Universal, and I uh, sat and watched them on the rides. But um, kids, family-related, hockey games. But it's pretty much what I like to do. Mike? Mike Beer? Yeah, hi, I'm Mike Beer. I run the Women's Therapy Rockefeller Cancer Institute in Little Rock, Arkansas. So, you know, Neil, Arkansas is a natural state. So you know what happens in the fall. So in the fall, it's deer hunting time. So there's nothing I love better to get up in that deer stand at five in the morning. It's nice and quiet. And you know what I'm doing? I'm listening to Neil Love and RTP while that eight <laughs> point comes across. Wow. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard a few good stories, but that's way up there. <laughs> so, Jennifer? Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Philippi. I work at Mass General in Boston. Um, I have a f almost four-year-old girl and a nine-month-old, so I'm, I'm, I'm so busy. I echo Brian's thoughts over there when, it's, when I'm not at work. I'm with the kids. Um, something you may not know about me, though, is that I do wedding calligraphy, so... Um, invitations and wedding signage. I haven't done, I used to have an Etsy website and everything, but um, since the kids, I just mostly do it for friends, but it, it's nice. It's fun. Good to know. So uh, Paul Anastasia, as always, Paul has been working for years. I got an email from her last night. You mind if I show a couple of pictures? I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, I'm not interested <laughs> at all. Um, since COVID, I'm more of an introvert, and my new initials are uh, JOMO, the joy of missing out, because I tend to be more introverted, contrary to popular belief. But I, um, I have no artsy talent, but I have tons of photos over the years. <laughs> so my new thing is sending cards to friends and family, <laughs> birthdays, holidays, thinking of you. And with the photos, I usually cut out the faces and make cartoons. And again, I know people can Photoshop and all that, but mine's more like a first grade level. <laughs> So um, these are just a couple of examples. So, well, we go. appreciate the humor. I don't do and yoga and I don't meditate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I'm to get down to business. Uh, here's where we're heading. We're going to start out uh, talking about endometrial cancer, and uh, we'll be emphasizing specific clinical scenarios as we go through these uh, 10 meetings. A lot of these are going to be advanced disease, but tonight when we talk about breast cancer, lots to talk about in terms of localized disease, but for these two cancers, we're going to be emphasizing a lot in terms of metastatic disease, and particularly the use of immunotherapy. I don't have to tell you the amazing impact that immunotherapy has had on the practice of oncology, or really just over the last, you know, five or six years, uh, and certainly endometrial cancer is a great example about how that has happened. We're going to get into that, and also the issue of how new clinical trials affect uh, practice. As it turns out, there were two gigantic studies in endometrial cancer just presented a few weeks ago at the Society of Gynecologic Oncology, and now docs who take care of these patients are trying to figure out, well, what are they going to do? We're going to kind of get into that a little bit. So, again, you can act as a good interface with the patients to try to help explain, you know, what they're seeing. Uh, and then we'll finish out uh, talking about uh, cervical cancer again a lot in terms of immunotherapy there, but also something that we're going to be talking a lot about over the next few days, which is antibody drug conjugates. Uh, this is a new evolving type of therapy, targeted therapy, uh, but really targeted therapy of chemotherapy. And one has been approved now in uh, cancer of the cervix, and now another one actually in ovarian cancer that we're going to talk about in one of the other meetings here. And then along the way, we will pick up on some of the psychosocial aspects of taking care of patients, and in particular, one of the themes that we've had at this uh, ONS meeting for a long time, which is dealing with patients who have minor children or grandchildren and the support that those uh, patients, and uh, Jennifer has a case of a patient with metastatic cervical cancer that we're going to use as a way to get into this. So we're going to start out just kind of providing a little bit of a background in terms of endometrial cancer. 
And maybe just before I even get started, I want to ask Brian, you as a gynecologic oncologist, Brian, we're going to talk today about, you know, metastatic endometrial cancer, all these new trials, new agents coming out. But can you uh, uh, provide a little bit of an overview of how these patients usually start out? Yep. And how do they present? What kind of symptoms they have? And how do you first, as a gynecologic oncologist, encounter them? You know, thanks, Neil. That's a, that's a great question. And, you know, the, the, how do these women present? Most women with endometrial cancer present with um, abnormal bleeding. Um, if it's a premenopausal woman, and you have to consider uh, premenopausal women still at risk for endometrial cancer, they have abnormal bleeding, and obviously postmenopausal, consider postmenopausal bleeding. Um, and at that point, the, the key next step, whether it's through a gynecologic oncologist or a benign gynecologist, is for endometrial sampling. Oftentimes we can do that in the office. If not, we go to the operating room or in the office to do a DNC or a D DNC hysteroscopy. Once we get the diagnosis of cancer, then um, a lot of times we do a metastatic workup for imaging to see if there's any lumps or bumps. In this um, patient, it's metastatic disease, so there would be a chance that we see something on CAT scan. And the next step um, is really a, a hysterectomy, surgical management. Um, most patients are early stage, disease limited to the uterus. But even in those patients with advanced stage disease, I like to do what you call control the pelvis. And if we can, take out the uterus in order to prevent the symptoms of abnormal bleeding down the road. But so, uh, Mike, just one other thing before we get into this first case. And what we've seen in many cancers, it really plays out uh, very strongly in endometrial breaking people down based on biomarkers. And again, that's going to be a theme as we go through the next 10 days, PD-1 levels. I mean, so many different assays that we're doing now to try to figure out what kind of therapy to give. And at least in terms of metastatic disease, Mike, one of the things that's kind of evolved that we're going to talk about today is so-called MSI status. So if you have a patient who has, you know, advanced metastatic endometrial cancer, one of the first questions you want to know is when you look at their tissue, are they MSI high or MSI stable? And there's a whole bunch of other, but Mike, can you just break down what the difference between those and how it affects the way we think about treatment? Sure, and, and, and it's, um, it's a really important point. Uh, I would go out to the point to say that no endometrial cancer patient, certainly with advanced stage disease, should... Um, N not get microsatellite um, uh, typing because it's so important prognostically and important predictively for some of the agents we're using. So historically, this was um, determined by looking at microsatellites directly, uh, and there was an there was an NIH commission on this. They have five microsatellites. It's a PCR assay. That assay is still available. If two or greater of the five microsatellites are are um, variable then it's MSI high. If it's one, it's low, and if it's zero, it's stable. But it's changed, and more recently what we look at, we actually look at the proteins that are involved in the repair of microsatellites, and there are four of them. And these assays can be done within the pathology suite of most pathology departments across the country. Uh, patients who are diagnosed with endometrial cancer should get that assay. And there are caveats to this. Sometimes that assay looks uh, and shows the proteins, and it looks like it's stable, but it still could be microsatellite high. That occurs in about three to five percent of the cases. So, think, think, IHC. You should definitely do that, and then think maybe your patient at some point should also get the PCR assay. So, um, just to you know, maybe elaborate a little bit. You know, when we talk tonight. We're going to talk about HER2 positive breast cancer and then the path that they take. Here is kind of similar, MSI high, endometrial cancer, MS stable. Yeah, you can get into all the vagaries of the type of you know, tests that are being done, but one way or the other, they're gonna make a decision whether it's MS stable, MSI, and that's gonna sort of guide the path. Brian? Yeah, and just to add to that, and you brought up a good point, we still are doing hormonal t um, testing for these patients, right. ER and PR positivity, and to your point with um, patients with high-risk histologies, serous and carcinosarcomas, we're also doing HER2 testing because there's some data to support the use of trastuzumab in these patients. And as we'll talk about, hormonal therapy is also used in low-grade endometrial cancer, but that's kind of the minority, but we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. All right, let's get a little real world here. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, patient you had who had MSI high endometrial cancer? 
Uh, and she actually got chemotherapy uh, plus an IO, in this case, pembrolizumab. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how she presented, what she was like as a patient? And particularly what I want to know is, like, what do you say to patients who are about to, about to begin immunotherapy? What are some of the key points? The patients are panicked, you know, you know anxious. What are the things that you really want to make sure they understand? Thank you. Dr. Love has given me three minutes, which is a <laughs> challenge. So this woman presented to us from another hospital. She was diagnosed at a, another hospital in Los Angeles with early stage endometrial cancer, and she only received uh, radiation brachytherapy, so vaginal. And then she recurred eight months later, and they started, so now she's metastatic, they started her on carboplatin and paclitaxel. So she had one cycle, and this woman is 70 years of age, she's a judge, highly educated, very intimidating, smart, but as we know with our patients, these patients are all the same. They're all scared and they're all vulnerable. So when she recurred, she, um, engaged in like concierge medicine and had a navigator. So anyway, she came to us for a second opinion. And my physician, Dr. Beth Carlin, very, very thorough as our gentlemen are. And we reviewed the path results and realized that this woman did have MSI testing the, for MM, uh, mismatch repair genes. And she was MSI high, so she had a deficiency. So it's like, oh my gosh, we should be adding pembrolizumab to this. So we had this discussion, and of course the discussion was not just the drug itself and the data, but also the cost and the authorization and you know, when are we going to start it, plus the side effects. So during this time of getting authorization, she was due for her second cycle of chemotherapy. So we started her on the chemotherapy and in the, before we started her on the IO. So we didn't start the IO until cycle three. So the discussion was it's different from chemotherapy, as you know. It's more of a targeted and it's, um, it in, inflames the immune system in the sense that it's going to kill the, the cancer cells that are hiding because it, it the cancer cells are binding to the PDL1, but the, the immunotherapy, the pembrolizumab in this situation is going to bind to the PDL1 and therefore identify the bad or the cancer cells and um, kill them. But the side effects, as most of you are aware, because it's approved for so many indications, are itises, so inflammation. So we're not going to have the hair loss that she's going to receive with the carboplatin and the paclitaxel, or the neuropathies, or the nausea, which are the things that we commonly talk about, but we're going to see more, well, fatigue is, is pretty much a given. We're going to commonly see rashes, inflammation, dermatological. We may see a change in stool. Now, our patients in GYN, malignancies, almost all of them across the board, constipation. So talking about loose stool is kind of like, hey, bring it on. But, but with the <laughs> education process, it's really important. And I found this so true in my practice when the physicians, with all due respect, they'll be asking the patients or telling them about diarrhea. What I want you guys to just take home is we have a grading system. So you want to know what your patient's baseline is. So we commonly see loose stool, but um, you know, I'll have clinicians say, oh, are you having Having any side effects? You have any change in bowels? Yes, I had diarrhea. They'll write that down. Whoa, whoa, here comes Paula. Okay, so define diarrhea. Well, I had one loose stool today. Well, that doesn't really constitute diarrhea. I'm looking for more than four over your baseline. So we really have to hone in, and that's what we do so well, is identifying those side effects. Because if we go to, from a grade one to a grade two, management is different. I have um, exceeded my three minutes. But we're talking about itises when we are talking about side effects. And I usually will call the patients later and continue my discussion. Go ahead. And yeah, we're going to talk about this uh, throughout this entire conference, throughout the entire week. And, you know, Jennifer, one of the things that we realize over the years is a lot of people are new to oncology. Whenever, you know, maybe 30% of people in this room have been in oncology less than five years. And for, for those of you who have just came in, it wasn't always like this. I mean, really, IOs came in maybe six years ago when it was approved in lung cancer. And Jennifer, there we saw a complete flipping of the infusion rooms. All of a sudden, there were lots of people now being treated for immunotherapy. It really required re-education of the entire office staff. How did you approach it at MGH, and how has it played out in terms of your awareness of these issues in these patients? That's such a good question. Um, 
I, first of all, echo Paula. Um, you know, I think these conversations uh, continue most of the time outside of the exam room when they're, they're calling in. Um, I always tell people to never worry alone, just when you think something is different, just call. It could be so minor that you might not think it's a big deal. Um, just for example, we had a patient on another immunotherapy, I think it was nivolumab, uh, call the other day and she felt like she had something stuck in her eye. Um, so we actually sent her to the mass eye and ear um, uh, emergency room and she had uveitis and they prescribed steroid drops. So it's just like, uh, you know, all those little nuances um, and different side effects that you see from, from chemotherapy traditionally, you know, we don't get uh, uh, blood, blood count drops usually. There is the fatigue, um, uh, some weight gain. We often see hypothyroidism, any of the itises, like Paula said, colitis, pneumonitis. So I think um, educating our infusion staff um, and our practice nurses was a, was a huge deal. And that's actually, I came on um, as a nurse practitioner around that time as well, about seven years ago. Actually, Dr. Beer hired me. <laughs> He's <laughs> since, he since left me. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been a, a big change. And I think, you know, at first, um, we even had some of the companies come in and provide um, some patient education and in-services and things like that. We did a couple in-services with the, the nurses and in infusion and our practice nurses. And then just being available, <sighs> especially to the practice nurses that are getting a lot of the phone calls. Um, you know, hey, this person has... Diarrhea. Okay, let's grade it. I love that point, Paula. Um, so, so yeah, I think um, it was a big change, but um, in oncology, we see changes all the time, and I think everyone took it in stride, and uh, we're lucky to have such great nurses. Yeah, I forgot you two uh, work together. So, Mike, another issue here, again, it's going to come throughout the, our entire series here. We're going to talk about a lot of different checkpoint inhibitors. Today, we're going to talk a lot about pembrolizumab and dostarlamab. But in our lung program, we'll talk about, talk about dervalumab, atezolizumab. Some of these are anti-PD-1, PD-L1. But Mike, I keep seeing that there's not much difference. I mean, whoever does the trial, the way they do the trial, that's the way we do it. But can you determine any difference between these different agents? Do you think it's, I'm not going to say that you can substitute them because you want to stick with the data and the FDA indication, but have you ever seen anything that makes you think one works differently, toxicity different, Mike? Yeah, it's a great question. And, um, and you know, the historic perspective here is when the Starlamab sort of broke with the Garnett trial, there was a suggestion that it penetrate the tumor better. It was at that point the only Q6 weak drug. Uh, and of course now Pembro is uh, in that class. I think most of us, um, having seen all the data, just acknowledge that both the Starlamab and Pembro are really wonderful targeted-related drugs. I don't see a lot of difference. Now, the caveat, because you mentioned all the agents, I, 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 think, the, um, I think the story on anti-PDL1 agents is still out because there's been a lot of negative trials, particularly in ovary and other um, uh, tumors where um, uh, the agent being used targets um, PDL1. As you know, there's a redundancy there, it's PDL1 and PDL2, so that may be a problem. But the anti PD1s, the Starlamab, Pembro, it's dealer's choice. So, um, and actually, you know, this whole idea of focusing on a marker on Thursday night, we're going to do a program that's, fo that's going to focus on four different cancers breast cancer, colon cancer. Upper, uh, gastroesophageal cancer and lung cancer, and all of it's going to be HER2. So we're just going to look at HER2 across the spectrum of different cancers. More and more you're seeing this. And Brian, MSI high is a, a big story also in cancer of the colon, as an example. They've done a lot of research on that. A lot of those patients in the metastatic setting, because we, as uh, Mike was saying, these patients with MSI high tumors, they really respond very, very well to checkpoint inhibitors in colon cancer, they just give checkpoint inhibitors alone, but we don't really have that data right now in endometrial cancer. A lot of people think maybe that would be the best way to really start these patients out. You're actually doing a trial that's going to try to look at that. Can you talk about right now how we think through the first uh, and second line of therapy in metastatic disease in these MSI high patients, Brian, and where you see, you see that heading? 
You know, um, uh, thank you. That's, that's an excellent point. Um, you know, one of my passions really is to get rid of chemotherapy for women with metastatic endometrial cancer. Um, and I know, and I love talking to this group because you guys do all the work. I'll be honest. You guys do all the work. You're the ones um, consenting patients, talking about side effects. How easy would it be if you just had to talk about like Pemero and Dostarlamab and those side effects as opposed to carboplatinum and paclitaxel and hair loss and numbing? So that's not why it's my passion. I want to do what's best for the patients, but it would make your life easier. Um, we learned from the colorectal um, studies. We learned, if you remember, last year there was a, a, re uh, a study on uh, rectal cancer patients, 13 patients. It changed the world. 13 for 13, giving dostarlamab had responses. So if you borrow from that disease setting, it sort of makes sense that MSI high patients with endometrial cancer may in fact not even need chemotherapy. They may respond alone to checkpoint inhibition. So well, there's actually two studies that are ongoing. I'm the global lead on one study that we're running with pembrolizumab, and there's a, a, a similar study um, called the Dominica trial that's running in Europe, looking at these MSI high DMMR, deficient MMR um, proteins, as Michael is describing, giving checkpoint alone versus chemotherapy. Now, we know that checkpoints work. And put things into perspective, you know, we're talking about first line, and we'll talk about more of this later, and, and Neil was referring to second line therapy. All women with endometrial cancer, all of them respond to immunotherapy. We'll talk about MSS and MSI, but all women deserve immunotherapy. So learning about these side effects is not just for the first line setting. It's going to be for the second line setting in all women. But, you know, I, I do believe that in this particular biomarker-driven group, MSI high, um, they deserve a checkpoint inhibitor, maybe by itself in the first-line setting. Um, if they haven't gotten it in the first-line setting, definitely in the second-line setting. Um, and whether or not it's with chemotherapy, we'll see. The one point, Neil, I want to add is we don't have data yet looking at checkpoint failures and to see if checkpoints work again. We are doing some studies on that, but right now um, that's not ready for prime time. So let's bring in another case just to keep uh, real patients in mind. And Jennifer, you have a 45-year-old woman also with MSI high uh, endometrial uh, cancer who uh, got an IO as well. What happened with her? Yeah, so she um, was treated uh, with upfront chemotherapy, um, carboplatin, paclitaxel, and then she got pelvic radiation and uh, vaginal brachytherapy as well, and uh, recurred three months later. So I think, you know, talking about how each patient is different and, and what makes one patient more or less difficult um, to care for, um, she w was a, a mess. She had just finished, what, six or seven months of treatment and was ready to say she was done with cancer and her first surveillance scan she had a, a supraclavicular node and was symptomatic and um, it, it was just it, it was hard to be sort of cautiously optimistic with her um, but this was right at the time actually I think this might have been one of Dr. Beer's patients I'll ask ask him after but um, Right, right at the time that we were starting to give pembrolizumab in this setting, her tumor was MSI high. So we started that, and within uh, three months, we saw a regression of her cancer, and with six months, um, we didn't see any cancer at all. And she was on for about two or three years, and she, you know, that's sort of, this is a whole different discussion, but sort of at the time where you go, okay, do we keep them on? Do we take them off? You know, so it's kind of a, a patient-centered discussion. Um, she decided to come off, and that was about three years ago. And we just recently saw her. She's thriving, doing really well. She's a younger son who's now uh, almost done with high school. Um, her husband had some severe um, anxiety during her treatment. He's doing much better, so... Um, she did very well, so it had to be my patient. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You, you know, one, one thing I just want to mention, you know, you'll hear, so cute. you know, a lot of amazing stories this week. We're not, we're not trying to say this happens to everybody, but the fact that it ever happens is pretty important to know. And I guess uh, before I ask uh, Brian for his uh, comment, just kind of curious, you mentioned that initial situation where three months afterwards she now has metastatic disease. At that point, her, her child was nine years old, and we'll yeah. talk later about that. I'm just kind of curious what it was like for you at that point. Uh, how did you deal with it yourself? And what's it been like for you these next years? 
Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, she was definitely one of those moms that um, kept a lot from her, from her um, child, um, from her son, and um, being protective. I mean, we, we all do this to so the people we love. Um, and then, you know, when she got sick again, it was sort of that conversation, you know, are you gonna tell your son? Does your family know this sort of thing? She's she's a strong person and, and didn't really let anyone in. Um, but I think it's important, and I think we'll talk a little bit uh, later um, about how to deal with children um, during these situations. But I think it is important to kind of bring them in and uh, don't keep them in the dark about these sorts of things that can actually cause them more stress, more anxiety than actually knowing the truth. So just sort of having those little conversations conversations with her, and not like a, a set conversation, but she'd be in and we'd be talking, that sort of thing, that, that nursing relationship that you have with, with your patients. And you know, when we talk about the bond that heals, this is it. You know, you think about what's happened over the last seven years, not just to her and her family, but to you, as you've seen Yeah, because they'll come in and they'll just be like, what do I say? I don't even know where to start, you know? It's, it can be really hard. Uh, Brian? You know, I love that answer. Um, two things. I love that answer because, you know, every Christmas, every holiday season matters, particularly if you could give an agent with minimal side effects. So sometimes we lose concept of that. We're looking at medians and we're looking at hazard ratios, but every holiday season really does matter. Well, one important point I really want to highlight about this case, young woman, DMMR, think about hereditary syndromes so we could better look out for her and her family. Um, you, want, want, you, want to, you want to do germline testing in this woman for Lynch syndrome, because if, in fact, you do find a germline mutation, this woman gets more intensive colon, colon cancer screening, as well as her family members. So, you know, when we're, when we're doing our job, we're not genetic counselors, but all of us have to have a role in treating the whole patient and their families. That's a great point. Of course, so we're going to talk about PARP inhibitors all week long, and this issue comes up is that if it's a germline or somatic mutation. Jennifer? I was just going to say you're very intuitive. She actually does have Lynch sy syndrome. So it's yep, so important for her, her son to know, and uh, for her, she gets all the proper screening with that and sees our genetics team and everything. Yeah, and one in the trenches point, um, in the, you know, because sometimes genetic counselors are, are few and hard to come by. In my patients, I'll do my own genetic testing. If they're, in fact, positive, then I'll send their family members for formal genetic screening. But if we know they're 45, if we know they're DMMR, to do a, a, a test on our own um, is probably most efficient. And before we go on to this uh, next case uh, from Paula, uh, just to get back to you, Mike, um, Brian was referring to this amazing study that came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering where they took people who had MSI high, but it was rectal cancer, and instead of giving chemo, radiation, and surgery, they just gave dostarlamab, and they all responded. And now I think they're up to like 30 patients, and they're, nobody knows. I mean, usually you see a high response rate, but you don't see 100%. Mike, any thoughts about, do you think that maybe we're going to be moving a checkpoint here was up earlier, even maybe neoadjuvantly in endometrial cancer? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I can't overemphasize the power of MSI high DMMR as a biomarker. It is incredibly strong. I mean, we talk about PDL1, and PDL1 is not a great marker, and it's, um, and it, it's not that predictive, but, but MSI high is very strong. And so I think, I, I, I don't think many of us in the field would be shocked that ultimately they'll get single agent IO if they have MSI high or defective MMR uh, and be able to avoid chemo completely and have a very high response rate. And also to keep in mind though, unfortunately this is the minority of the patients. Most of them are not MSI high, they're MS stable, so to speak. And that's what we're about to get into now, metastatic disease there, because there you think about it a little bit differently. And then we're gonna bring in these two new studies that just came out a few weeks ago in terms of how that might have affected things. But let's hear about this 68-year-old uh, lady who got, and the most common therapy is an IO uh, with lenvatinib, usually pembrolizumab, lenvatinib. This patient also got something we're gonna talk about tomorrow night, as I mentioned in the HER2 program, which is gonna focus on antibody drug conjugates. An antibody drug conjugate, we're gonna talk about it tonight in breast cancer, TDXD, really an amazing, amazing story. But what happened with this lady, Paula? So this is another woman that presented to us, initially treated at an outside institution, a, a, a good center. She presented to us seven years later with a new recurrence. She had liver mets of her, what was 
initially stage one endometrial cancer. And she had appropriate surgery and everything, but NED for seven years. So she presents to us, biopsy proven, the whole thing, review her pathology, and of course, as the physician said, we always want to be doing molecular testing now, and that's testing for the mismatch repair genes, and that's what we keep saying, the MMR. So we're looking for either a typo or a deficiency, or we're looking for intact. Intact means they're MSI stable. So this woman had MSI stable endometrial cancer. So knowing that um, uh, previously treated, she's in a recurrent setting, we gave her Pembro and Lenvatinib. Actually, I think uh, we gave her uh, Carbo, Paclitaxel, and then she recurred. So um, without getting into all the weeds, she was eligible for Pembro and Lenvatinib because she was MSI stable. So that's a whole new teaching game as well. So we're talking about IO, pembrolizumab, and talking about the side effects that are different than chemotherapy. So we're gonna see more itises. Commonly, we're going to see fatigue and rash, and diarrhea, loose stool. And as Jenny mentioned, a pneumonitis is life-threatening. We don't see it commonly, but we definitely want to educate patients. If you have a change in a dry cough, which normally we would ignore, um, you know, definitely tell us with that. We're also going to give combination oral medication, lenvatinib, which has a whole different uh, side effect profile, and that includes hypertension. So think about your population in GY oncology where we're treating bevacivimab, we're used to managing patients with hypertension and nosebleeds. We will commonly see this with lenvatinib. We are also going to see fatigue with that, but also we're going to see diarrhea or loose stool. So now we have two agents that have a, com, uh, a risk for diarrhea. So that's kind of where we um, you know, pay attention to that in our education and really p paying attention um, to our patients. So this woman did very well for about four uh, cycles, and then her, she started to have more fatigue, more loose stools. Uh, the lenvatinib FDA dose is 20 milligrams, two 10 milligram pills. It also comes in four milligrams. So we dose reduced her because she's in a recurrent. She's an older woman. That's not the reason to dose reduce, but she also um, has a small BMI, and um, more frail, although she's a sturdy female like all of us in this room. Sorry, guys. But um, <laughs> so we dose reduced her to 14 milligrams up front. And she did well for the four months. And then she started losing weight and the fatigue got worse. She's married to a gentleman for, for 40 years who's 20 years older than her. So he's in his 90s and she's kind of taking care of him. She's got nine grandchildren. Anyway, I get a call from him him that she, um, and if, if he's calling me, something's wrong. She has fallen out of her chair and she's confused. Anyway, she gets to the ER. She has hyponatremia, uh, um, sodium of 121. She's anemic. Um, she's hospitalized for several weeks. Correct that. The CT scan shows that she is responding to Pembro and Levatinib, but, you know, the, looking at the quality of life, we have decided that we can dose reduce her more from the lenvatinib and go down to 10 milligrams and continue the pembrolizumab. But long discussion with the family, and we decided that we would stop treatment. So anyway, we're looking at her molecular profiling, and we do next generation sequencing. So we're looking at all the somatic markers, and we're seeing that she, and as Dr. Sloma, some of it said, we looked at her two, and she is plus one, which used to mean negative. Now we call it her two low, and we now have a medication that is tissue agnostic. It's FDA approved for uh, breast cancer, her two low, but we thought, well, let's try it. So we're going off label here, uh, full disclosure there. So we got, F, not F, we got insurance approval for TDXD, and she's already had six cycles. CT scan shows NED. She says, oh my gosh, my quality of life is so good. She does not have side effects. Now, the most important side effect with that life-threatening is pneumonitis. So once again, that dry cough, any changes in fatigue, She's not had anything. Her counts have been stable. We monitor her every three weeks when she comes in. She knows, you know, she has my cell phone to call me. 
and amazing. The only thing she has is alopecia, which she says, if that's all I have, that's great. And she does, her, her, she's had a PET CT, NED, she does not want to be taken off. So now we're having the discussion, do we stop? Do we give her maintenance? Don't know. But yeah, fascinating, this tissue agnostic now. So uh, coming back tomorrow night, we're going to talk a lot more about what ha you know, happened to people like this. But just to get back to the main issue here, I think so far we've gotten the message that if somebody has metastatic endometrial cancer, uh, you need to know what their MSI status is. People with MSI high do well, low toxicity. We, we talk about autoimmune complications, but a lot more people sail through, no problem. But now, Brian, we're talking about adding a tyrosine kinase inhibitor which is used throughout oncology, lenvatinib, used in a bunch of other cancers, hepatocellular, we're talking about Friday morning as an example. Can you talk a little bit about this regimen? It also is not as effective as, for example, the IOs like dostarlamab and Pembro and MSI. What do you expect out of benefit in these patients, Brian? And can you talk a little bit about the practical issues of trying to give this, uh, give this uh, a regimen which if you use it at the full dose, a lot of people have problems. You're here in docs and practice saying, well, maybe we ought to start lower. This is the whole issue of a drug gets approved, you have a trial, but then you gotta figure out what the best way is to give it. What have we learned in the last couple of years about this strategy, Brian? Yeah, no, it's, it's a complicated strategy, you're right, and it's something that you re really need to proactively manage. To your first point, as far as a lower response rate, the first study, which got an accelerated approval, showed about a 36% response rate of pembrolinvatinib in the MSS patients, compared to about 50% in the MSI hit patients with single agent. But 36% is still better than anyone, anything else that we um, use at the time for endometrial cancer. It was compared to the standard chemos, and so it did get FDA approval, followed by a full approval with what we call 775, but... Um, that's just the technicality of some of the studies. So how do I manage the side effects of lenv lenvatinib and pembrolizumab? I start managing them immediately when I decide that I'm going to use it, before they even leave the office and don't even have a scheduled CTU appointment. What do I mean by that? They have to control their blood pressure. With lenvatinib, we do see a high level of uh, a high number of patients getting hypertension, even if they have hypertension, a lot worse than they normally have. So I have them monitoring their blood pressure levels immediately. If there's even a trend towards going up, they get on antihypertensive as soon as possible. So that's the, really the first thing I do to manage these side effects. I even have the patients do a little diary um, and send them to the, the diary to my nurse practitioner because they help out tremendously um, in managing it immediately, especially when I start. Um, the other side effect, as mentioned, is diarrhea. Um, it's important to distinguish or try to distinguish the diarrhea that's caused by linvatinib versus the diarrhea that's caused by pembrolizumab. So if I have a patient on the combination that has both, um, I do the simple thing. I stop linvatinib for a period of time. If the diarrhea resolves, I know what it's from. If it doesn't resolve, I know what it's from. And then we manage those side effects uh, the, the, based on the origin of the diarrhea. He's talked about dose. I'm a purist. I, I like to follow the label. I do. So um, it doesn't mean I haven't started at 14 in some of the more frail um, patients, but in general, I like to start at 20. Um, and then dose reduced, which a lot of the patients will be dose reduced, but dose reduced based on that. The reason is simple. I would hate to start off with a lower dose, find out that it's not effective or not working, and it's not working based on the fact that I started at that lower dose. So as, be most, uh, as best as I can, I start at the 20 and go down from there. And that's how I manage it. And I just got to say, Paul, you guys are managing it. You guys are on top of your game because you guys are really managing things. Um, not only what the current standard is, you're predicting the future a little bit. Um, and I, I, I congratulate you're you on that. You're not hurting my feelings by telling me how you do practice because you're absolutely right. So it's individualized. It's individualized. And the last thing you did talk about, I mean, I know you're talking more about the destiny data tonight, um, Neil, at your breast cancer, but there has been a press release, so this is in the public domain. At ASCO, they will be presenting data on the pan tumor use of the TD, uh, TXD. Um, and we're excited. And I know there's some endometrial cancer patients in that, so we're really excited to see some of that data. So, you know, you think about what happened to this patient, how it changed her life. It was because people were aware that there was something else going on in oncology, so we need all hands on board 
to be aware of that. And Mike, can you just add in any thoughts you have? You know, this regimen is a challenging one, but there's some people who go through fine. There are other people who start to have problems, it gets nipped in the bud and they do fine. And there are other people who end up in the hospital for a few weeks. What's your experience and how do you work with your staff to try to get people through this? Yeah, I, um, I, I think it's a, an excellent point. I essentially agree with Paula and Brian. I'm a purist too, I start at 20. Um, I think the take home message if for all you that might be experienced with bevacizumab induced hypertension, this is not bevacizumab induced hypertension. It comes on very fast, very steep. Um, so I think anticipating it is important. Uh, I've never had a patient come off for diarrhea that's usually manageable. Um, and then probably the most bothersome thing, assuming you can control the blood pressure and you can control the diarrhea, is frankly fatigue is an issue. And, and because even grade two fatigue for active women is a problem. Uh, and that's where the staff could really help out uh, in terms of managing it. Uh, the nursing staff is absolutely critical to this. Uh, interestingly, when I was at MGH, you know, Jenny remembers this, but we, we did the single agent which at that point had a number on it, didn't, it wasn't called levatinib, and odd, oddly enough, the, the single most important toxicity at high doses was weight lost. I had a patient who lost 35% of her body weight and refused to come off the drug because she was doing so well. Um, it was completely reversible. It's a central inhibition of appetite. Uh, I suggested to ESI that they might market it for weight loss, but they didn't take me up on that. Yeah, it sounded like that would have been kind of interesting. Okay, let's bring up one more case. Uh, again, just to kind of go back and forth between the theory and the practice. And Jennifer, you had this 62-year-old uh, woman. Again, MS stable as uh, determined by analysis of the tissue. She got the pembro lenvatinib uh, regimen. What happened? So uh, we, so at Mass General, we do things a little bit differently. We actually usually start at 14 milligrams. Most of the physicians do. Um, <laughs> I know it's it's a big debate, uh, um, but what we try to do is is start them and then um, ramp them up. So in this particular case, this woman's 62 year old. She's a pharmacist. Um, you know, good medical literacy. Her husband's very supportive. She started on 14, and about two weeks later, uh, she was doing great. So we increased her to 20 milligrams. And I will say, she's been the only patient in our practice. I don't know if this actually reflects poorly on me, but uh, that's been able to stay at 20 milligrams. And she's been on for about 18 months, and Jeez. she's she's thriving, doing really well. Her scans show no evidence of disease. Um, but I, I think all the points about toxicity are, are really great. This is a hard drug to manage. I get inundated with messages and calls. Um, so when I first start, when we first start people on lenvatinib, they get, you know, of course, um, we, we tell them about the side effects, but it's hard, no one listens. Uh, so they get a sheet that tells them how it's gonna come to them from a specialty pharmacy in the mail. They get it set up with a blood pressure monitor that day so that they're not scrambling to figure out their blood pressure. They have to send me weekly logs of their blood pressure and we tell them of course to call if, if it's higher before then. Um, but I think uh, I would say hypertension has, has been one of the hardest side effects to manage. You know, people on two, three blood pressure, Agents, um, and then the weight loss, like Dr. Beer said, um, can, can be quite significant. This patient had some hypertension we were able to control. She had some uh, hypothyroidism on thyroid replacement. Um, she had hand foot syndrome. We had to send her to derm. They put her on a beta methasone cream. So she's having the side effects. We're just managing them. She had some diarrhea. We held the drug, went back on. She's, you know, so she. Um, she is having all the side effects, but I think it, it really plays into our nursing team and, and um, having that, again, that nurse-patient relationship where they know they can reach out and when to reach out, and the education is so important because without all that, this patient would have come off, you know. So, you know, it's, oh, we talk about the issue of why was it different to take care of a, a patient, and one of the things that makes it different is they're a healthcare professional. I mean, you can have uh, oncology nurses your patient or a medical oncologist. What was it like to take care of her with her background in pharmacy? She did a little bit of um, self 
prescribing or <laughs> wanted to do, I would say. You know, she would message frequently, you know, oh, my thyroid level is a little bit up. Should I increase, you know, you know, so we, it was often kind of like, let's slow down. Um, you know, we'll test, t- test you next time you're in. And, um, you know, but I appreciate that, right? I'd rather have her reaching out and, like I said, never worry alone. Um, so I appreciated it, but yeah. Paul? Can I uh, poll you guys that, um, so what level of TS, um, hypothyroidism do you begin a thyroid medication? When the TSA is, do you have a baseline or, like we'll do it when it's over 10. We'll, yeah. s- we'll start. So I was just wondering. I, I use fold increase, so it'd be a five-fold increase. Okay, fivefold. Okay. I think the po- important point is that people need screening tests for thyroid function right. if they're on uh, uh, check one inhibitors. Even a year, or in, you know, sometimes people are on. You heard about your patient on for a couple of years. They can be hyperthyroid. They can be hypothyroid clinically, and you want to pick this up if you can uh, by uh, blood work. And the final thing we want to talk about is we kind of as cr- created the platform of looking at particularly metastatic endometrial cancer here today. But we also want to talk about how clinical trials might be affecting this next year. We come back here or wherever ONS is next year in terms of, and as I mentioned, we saw these two very, very important, some of the most important trials that I think have been reported in gynecologic oncology. They all, both of them came at the exact same time a few weeks ago. They matured, they were ready to report. And uh, one was called the Ruby trial, looking at dostarlamab, as we talked about, uh, a uh, immunotherapy. And then the other, an NRG study, uh, looking at pembrolizumab. In both cases, they combined it with chemotherapy. Just to contrast that to colon, they, in colon, they looked at just uh, chemo, immunotherapy alone versus chemo. Here, they're adding it on another strategy that kind of makes a lot of sense. Both of these trials had both MS-stable and MSI uh, patients. Um, Mike, it was kind of hard to separate out. I mean, you can get into the details of the trials, but just kind of globally, they looked like they both showed definitely an improvement by adding an IO with uh, chemotherapy, MSI. Nobody was surprised at that. But then MS-stable, the question is, there was a benefit. But are you going to do that? Are you going to add an IO in to chemo in first line? Or just give the chemo and then do something like IO pembrolizumab second line? And what we really want to know is, are, in the long run, what's better for the patients How are, in terms of quality of life and length of time? And as is often the case, we don't know. So what we're going to be doing now with these two trials is people are going to try to figure out, well, how do I bring this into my practice? Do I want to add the IO on to chemotherapy in this patient or wait? Mike, again, it's just been a few weeks. What's been the chat about this? And what do you think we're going to be saying next year this time? How are we going to be treating metastatic endometrial cancer? Yeah, they were, um, they were home runs. And they were presented high profile, well-conducted studies, very strongly positive. Um, I think Ruby is a little less positive than Energy 018 partly because there were carcinosarcomas and clear cells in there, but they're still very positive. The, the only debate in my view is, and I think they're gonna to go to regulatory approval, the only debate will be, uh, will the FDA look at this really critically and say, you know, the biggest bang for your buck is in the DMMR group, uh, and we think that's a great biomarker, and so that's all we're going to approve. I, if I were to, Flip the coin, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be an all-comer approval. So, and we'll see how people respond to this, what they do in their practice. I want to bring in another, we can come back uh, to these two studies, uh, but this is very common in oncology where you have trials come out and you really have to indirectly compare things. You can't, mm. the, scientifically, you want to do a study that randomizes between two options. But a lot of times you don't have the study that you want, so you have to look at one trial indirectly, as Mike was saying, maybe different patients pick, different situations. It's a real challenge. And then when we go out and say to docs in practice or to investigators, what do you do? We see three or four different answers, and I bet that's what we're going to see the next. And then other times you ask people what they do, everybody says the same thing. This thing is going to lead to a lot of controversy, I am sure. 
I just want to bring in one other uh, issue, but first let me just ask before we get into the idea of new agents. So Selenexer is an agent that's being looked at as, as possibly uh, being used. It's already used in multiple myeloma and in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which we're doing a program on uh, tomorrow morning as well. But before we kind of get into uh, Selenexer as maybe a new uh, treatment, uh, just to co uh, come back to uh, you, Paula, when you think about uh, sort of the, the route that a patient might take, you know, one possibility might get, for example, with either MS stable or MSI. They could start out with chemo and then go to an eye, uh, immunotherapy. Or now with these trials, assuming it gets approved, which probably it will, you could add in the IO first line. From a nursing point of view, any thoughts about whether it's going to be more challenging to add the IO into the chemotherapy or maybe just wait until the second line and give it with lenvatinib? You weren't expecting that one, were you? I wasn't. That's how this whole thing is. It's, but it's like a patient comes to me and asks me questions that I have to be prepared. What was the question again? No. So, um, no, we, so right now, we, we, you know, if somebody is MSI high, we will add in the Pembro with the carboplatin and the paclitaxel. But if they're MSI stable, then we won't add in the Pembro, and we will save it uh, second line. But I know you're going to present this data, but I think that it's very interesting now, if patients have metastatic disease and they're on chemotherapy, when they're done with chemotherapy, they're like, yay, yay, yay. But they're also scared and they're vulnerable. And it's like, you know, I have a high chance of this coming back. So I know there's a controversy in maintenance therapy, but I... I know a lot of patients really want something, and we are doing a lot of maintenance pembrolizumab for two years, and you know bevacizumab for the other diseases. So I think the concept of maintenance is very promising for patients to want to do. And maintenance is done in many other situations. We're going to talk about ovarian cancer now, standard a PARP inhibitor, sometimes bevacizumab. We'll see how this plays out over the next uh, year in terms of endometrial cancer. But let's just talk a little bit about you know, new agents, because Brian, we're always looking to try to improve things. Can you talk a little bit about what Selenexer is, how it works, and what we know about an endometrial cancer? Sure. Um, no, Neil, thanks for that question. Before I answer that, I want to say something else that I'm very passionate about, is that diversity in our trials. Okay, and the reason why I'm saying that in the endometrial session is that black women with endometrial cancer have a two times higher risk of death than white women. So when we talk about these trials, it's important to talk about diversity. We used to think it's access to care. It's not. There's something different in the biology of the disease or in the response to therapies, and we're still learning about that. So when we talk about all these trials, um, we have to focus on that. To Michael's point, maybe the PMR patients have a higher percentage of uh, minority diverse patients, and we need to um, come up with better treatment options. Um, skip forward, Selenexer. It's a very active agent. It's a nuclear transport inhibitor. Um, what we, we, we've done one trial on it in the maintenance setting. To Paula's point, patients like something. So after chemotherapy, we did a trial looking at all patients with endometrial cancer, and we gave this as a maintenance therapy versus placebo. This was in what we call the Siendo trial. Um, we ran that through our GOG partners group. What we found is that they're about the same. In all patients, there was not much of a difference. However, talking about biomarker-driven therapies, P53 is another biomarker that we look at. In patients who are P53 wild type or normal P53, the curves were different. There was an improvement in outcome in those patients who took Selenexer versus placebo in the P53 wild type group. We got excited. The company got excited. We went to the FDA and said, let's approve it. And the FDA said, it looks great data but go do another phase three randomized trial. Just look at those patients with P53 wild type tumors, and we're doing that. We, we, we started the trial, it's called the export trial. Um, we're running that also through the GOG, randomizing those patients with P53 wild type tumors in the maintenance setting who respond to chemo of Selenexa versus placebo. Last point, now we've really confused ourselves. Should we give those patients chemotherapy and Pember or chemotherapy and dostarlamab, or do we give those patients chemotherapy followed by maintenance Selenexer? Um, 
my job is to help figure that out. I lead the portfolio for endometrial cancer in the GOG group, um, and we're going to try to figure that out. But in the meantime, we need to complete these studies before we do that. So yeah, even in ad advanced disease, you know, we might have a targeted therapy like Selinexor or PARP inhibitors, but then we can look more into the tumor to get better clues about whether it's going to work or not. And as Brian said, with Selinexor, uh, Mike, we saw the strong signal in the subset who did not have this one uh, particular marker. Can you talk about your thoughts about the whole idea of bringing in a new agent like Selinex or Mike? What are some of the things that are taken into consideration? We already heard that by these two new trials came out, it all affected the way they were even thinking about doing studies um, on this. And also the issue of toxicity. Because what we hear from the myeloma people is issues with GI toxicity and how you think this is going to play out. Yeah, I, you know, again, we, we you know, meetings like this, we'll talk about new and novel agents coming, coming along. Um, and, and because oncology has changed so much, we kind of get used to it. The truth is that the beauty of Selinexor and the excitement about it is that it's a completely novel target. This, tar this agent, th this target, x has not been utilized. And please remember that what's in the nucleus that gets brought out these are a lot of tumor suppressor genes, which actually have a dramatic effect on tumor cells. So it all makes sense, and so there's a lot of excitement about it. But how do you get an agent like this um, essentially into the clinic? Well, um, you, 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 first of all, you need to very carefully um, classify and characterize its toxicity. In this case, there's a fair amount of GI toxicity, so I think it's going to be interesting to see how the endometrial cancer trial plays out, because remember, it's being given as maintenance. Maintenance therapies tend to demand minimal toxicity, but, but I don't think we know yet. So that's one, that's one important issue. Uh, and then the other issue, as you're bringing up, Neil, is that um, we're now classifying all these endometrial cancers into different groups. The one that no one really knows what to do with are the tumors with wild type P53. That's where this agent works. So it, it kind of fits nicely into the portfolio, I think. So we'll see th well, where things head. Just a couple more words uh, about IOs uh, in endometrial cancer, and then we're going to move on and talk about cervical cancer. Jennifer, I know you actually had patients go into the Ruby study that was just what we just talked about, which uh, looked at Dostarlamab. Uh, you know, I guess really when you look at it, it's kind of hard to separate that out in terms of how it works or even clinically uh, what you see in terms of efficacy or tolerability. What was your experience in the few people that you had who re were on that study? Yeah, um, I think it was a placebo-controlled study, so I, you weren't sure if they were getting the dostarlamab or not, and then there was some maintenance after. Um, I would say, you know, it was only a couple of patients, to be honest, but um, I, I didn't see... Um, you know, overly bothersome um, toxicity from adding the IO. I'm not sure what the other panelists um, feel, but I, I didn't really find that there was, um, you know, it was too hard to, for the patients to handle or anything. It was just sort of like adding on that extra um, thought process when the patient did have a, a symptom like diarrhea or, um, you know, fatigue, you know, we want to check their thyroid along with anemia studies, that sort of thing. Brian, any thoughts? Yeah, no, you're spot on. The, the data of the adverse events in these two trials showed that the addition of the checkpoint inhibitor was not synergistic in its adverse events. It still it had the adverse events that we expected and no more um, than, than that. Uh, the other point I want to add, when we're talking about clinical trials, it's interesting. We, we know the results of these two trials. There's two other ongoing trials looking at not only adding checkpoint, but PARP inhibition as well, DUO-E. Um, is one of them looking at dervalimab with olaparib, and also Ruby Part 2 looking at dostarlamab with niraparib in that setting. So again, we're a lot in the future. The future's bright. Mike, what's the thinking about bringing in a PARP inhibitor you know, to add to immunotherapy? I've, I've heard of that strategy uh, with ovarian cancer as well. And also we got a question from the audience. Are these IOs in interchangeable? Like can you use dostarlamab and lenvatinib? Yeah. So I'll start with the, the, the latter comment, I think. Again, everything we know, the Starlamab and Pembro are roughly the same drugs. Uh, if you're going to add the Starlamab to Levatinib, that combination, to my knowledge, has not been tested. So I, you're out in data-free zone. Um, and then, um, you know, I think we use, again, 
I, I, the companies don't like me to say this, but I, again, for me, the Starla Mab and Pembro are effectively interchangeable, particularly with the Q6 week regimen. So I, I don't think that's a big issue. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, cervical cancer, and we're again going to get into uh, the issue of uh, uh, immunotherapy here as well. Uh, Jennifer, you have a young patient, uh, 36 years old, and that's not uncommon for people with cervical cancer. What happened with her? Yeah, so th this is one of those heartbreaking, gut-wrenching cases that I'll never forget. Um, this is a, a, a young woman who um, actually presented with early stage disease, was HPV positive, um, and missed several PAP appointments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that We could talk about that more too. I, it's um, just really, you know, you want to go back and just like, you know, shake her or her, you know, team and get her in there for her pap. But anyway, she had early stage disease, um, some uh, abnormal bleeding when she first presented. Um, we went through all the standard of care treatment. Um, she progressed, uh, again, quickly at the first surveillance scan. Um, lung mets, bone mets, incredibly painful bone mets. Um, we gave her bevacizumab, carboplatin, paclitaxel. She progressed through that very quickly, and eventually we put her on pembrolizumab, and she progressed on that and ultimately uh, passed away during that time. Um, but, you know, just to, we're talking about psychosocial aspects today, too, and, um, you know, when I think about someone's psychosocial sort of health, I think about psychologic social and biological. So she had all kinds of things going on for the psychologic aspect. She had poor coping mechanisms. Um, she was in den denial about the prognosis, um, didn't really, really want to engage in end of life or serious illness conversations. Um, the trauma of this diagnosis alone at such a young age played into that. Um, socially, she was divorced. She had two younger kids. Um, you know, I, I saw a lot of myself in her, which I thought, I mean, I'm sure we've all been there before. Um, so I think it just made it really, really hard to kind of remove yourself from these sort of situations. Um, she, her, luckily her mom was a huge support for her, so that was helpful. Um, and she had been a bartender, so she didn't have a lot of um, income available. Um, they didn't, you know, give her any good um, health insurance or um, package or any income during this time. So she had a lot going on. And then biological, like I said, that her pain um, was really intense. She was on narcotics that took away her independence. She couldn't drive. Um, so we enacted all sorts of services for her, um, palliative care, who was uh, tremendous in helping her pain and then kind of navigate those, those serious conversations toward the end. Um, uh, social work, of course, was incredibly helpful. And then at Mass General, we are so lucky to have a department and a team called Parenting at Challenging Times, or the PACT team. Um, so they help patients navigate conversations with their children. They, ha they have social workers that can meet with the children themselves. Um, so this was a, a godsend for this patient. Um, and I don't know how much more you want me to talk on that right now, um, but I could share just a, a few lessons learned or... Um, yeah, we'll maybe that. we can. Get, I would like to uh, learn uh, more about what you learned, but also I was, as you were describing this, I was just flashing during one of the pandemic years when we, we kept going with this series, we did it virtually. I remember one year we had like, like we were working with like 25 nurses and I asked each one of them, when was the last time somebody said, isn't it depressing to be in oncology? Yeah. And the average was like two weeks. <laughs> you know? So it's a, a common question that we hear and you, when you hear cases like yeah. this, that is what came to my mind. And I'm just kind of curious, as you look back over this terrible situation that you were dealing with, did you feel a sense of reward that you were doing something for her, maybe that another person might not have been able to do? Yeah, I, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, because you are, again, bringing in that, that nurse-patient relationship. You're sort of their, their go-to person during the hardest time in their lives and probably their family's lives. So yes, it's definitely rewarding, but did I cry on the car ride home multiple days? Yes. <laughs> 
Paula, any thoughts about that? And, you know, we were also, you were, we were talking about the patient before who relapsed and, and, you know, three months later, these terrible situations that we go through with patients. Again, this question of, and we, you know, we started out talking about getting away from things and how much that helps, again, for people new to oncology. Any thoughts about the, this, this idea of oncology being a depressing place to be? Well, my initial thought is, thank goodness we're not ending with that story. (laughs) No, that was very, very heartbreaking. And I bet every one of you have been asked, how do you do what you do? It's so depressing. But I know that we also, like you said, there's a secondary gain. I know every one of us in this room and on this panel make a difference. And our patients humble us. I was telling her, my bangs are too short and they're uneven, but who cares? I have hair. And it's like our patients teach us so much about life. And, you know, I know we overuse. It's a privilege to take care of them. But, you know, if we had to do all over again, I wouldn't do it different, differently. So it just... it. You know, and I don't want to sound Pollyanna. It just makes us grateful and humbled. And, you know, we're so glad for the scientists and the researchers that, you know, I started 30, okay, 40 years ago. And now, you know, our patients are living so much longer. Might not be curing them, but they're living longer and they're living so much better because of everything that you do. But also that you all are different people. You're special people. You're not like the average person. These are not average people. You are different in terms of, you know, the value system you have, what reward you get out of life. And God bless you, too, for what you do for these patients. Let's get back to some of the science of this, Brian. Again, thinking about, maybe you can provide a little bit of, uh, from your point of view as a gynecologic oncologist on cervical cancer, um, how it typically presents. And in these situations where you actually see metastatic disease and people dying of uh, cervical cancer, what's the path that they've taken to sort of get there? Yeah, no, that's a a great question. It's a nice review. So over cervical cancer, you know, thank God we've seen a decrease in the number of cases and the number of deaths since not only um, pap tests, which was several years ago, um, but um, HPV vaccines. Now we know that HPV vaccination can decrease the amount of cervical cancers. Simple as that. Um, We recommend vaccination uh, between the ages of 11 and 12 or even earlier at parent discretion. Um, The argument that parents say, well, their daughters aren't going to be at risk, um, doesn't hold water. We don't care about what their individual daughter is going to do. We want to make sure that we vaccinate the population. In addition, we should be vaccinating boys because it's a concept called herd immunity. In order to vaccinate the population, you not only vaccinate those affected, but those that also could transmit HPV as well. Um, So those are ways that we decrease the the incidence and mortality of the disease. Um, pap smears should be done according to the current guidelines. Um, those women at, at risk or with abnormal paps more frequently. If you have negative paps, you could do it every three years. 50% of the women with cervical cancer did not have a pap within the uh, last five to 10 years. So you could decrease the incidence right away by doing a pap, which is nice. We know that the precancerous stages are slow and indolent. So if you diagnose an abnormal pap, you know, you go down the road of colposcopy, biopsies, even a leap, but you have time to intervene in the natural progression of the disease, which is very, very important. Um, once they're diagnosed, patients with early stage lesions, um, what we like to call 1B1 or less, or if it's uh, less than four centimeter sized tumor, we're still doing surgery. Um, and I know so, um, th- this focus really isn't on what goes on in the operating room, but it's important to mention that the surgery, you know, with all of our advances in minimally invasive surgery, a prospective study published in the New England Journal led by Pedro Ramirez at MD Anderson showed do open surgery. Those women who have robotic radical hysterectomies have a higher risk of death and recurrence due to the disease than open surgery. Outside this, the, talking about the reasons why is a whole other hour talk. Greater than 1B disease, but less than widely metastatic disease, chemosensitizing radiotherapy. When you give whole pelvic radiation, sometimes it's focused a little bit more to go up on the lymph node change, b- chain based on findings, but we also give it with chemosensitizing cisplatin. Um, in that setting, we've already done one study, and there'll be another study that's coming out soon, but the first study showed adding checkpoint to those patients, and we're learning that checkpoint's immunotherapy works in cervical cancer. But in newly diagnosed patients, adding checkpoint does not improve outcome. And then we just also published a paper recently published called the Outback Trial showing adding chemotherapy doesn't help those patients as well. So the gold standard, chemosensitizing um, radiotherapy. 
Now in advanced disease, what we call stage 4B disease, um, we don't realize this because we've been focusing on endometrial cancer the last several months, but the world changed there as well. The world changed. We're given four drugs. Platins, taxane, bevacizumab, which we showed worked several years ago, but also now we add, there's a study showing adding pembrolizumab to that group. The first response I get from all of my colleagues, from all the nurses I work with, nurse practitioners, is, oh, you're going to give four agents? You know, what, are you crazy? Do it. Do it in your practice. See how it works. Administer it in your chemo units. It's tolerable. It, and, and it has a better outcome in those women than just giving the three therapies alone. So immunotherapy, again, for all, and that's biomarker-directed PD-L1. 88% of the patients will have that, but it adds to the therapy, and we know that it's that important. Yeah, we're not talking about myeloma this week, but, uh, you know, there, it's not uncommon to start with quadruple uh, therapy. Mike, you know, we were talking about how sensitive these patients with MSI high endometrial cancer are uh, to checkpoint inhibitors. What about cervical cancer? To me, it seems, you know, not anywhere near as exciting can you talk about that? And also in terms of how, um, how you predict whether or not somebody's going to benefit. Can you look at PD-1 level? Can you look at why they got it, whether HPV positive or not? And are any of these subsets really responsive? Or more typically, do you see this uh, terrible downhill course that uh, was just described? Yeah, I, I, and as Brian pointed out, there really has been a paradigm shift in terms of being able to actually treat some of these patients. But I think the, also the take-home message is this is an HPV, it's a viral-induced cancer. Why is the response rate only 14%? There's something about the disease we don't really understand yet. And at a minimum, that response rate should be higher than that. So I think novel I.O. combinations are what you're going to see in the future, and hopefully they'll be in trials and you get your patients on there. Uh, to try to increase the response rate. Um, we do pdl one staining. That is the indication. I think it's a lousy biomarker, but um, we do it anyway. Um, I have treated patients who did not have pdl one staining. The insurance company didn't have a problem with it. Um, but again, the, as a biomarker, it increases your response rate from 12% without it to 14%. So it's pretty pretty minimal at, at, at present. Uh, do remind you that there is microsatellite unstable cervical cancers. There's also microsatellite unstable ovary cancer. We forget about that. It's very low. It's about 1%. But if you find it, um, please note it because those patients are likely to respond to an IO agent. So we're going to finish out with one more case from Paul, and this is a patient who got an antibody drug conjugate. Uh, to sodomab vidotin mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about in general about um, in terms of ADCs tonight with breast cancer, TDM1s in ADC, uh, trastuzumab, daratuxan, uh, sasituzumab uh, also. Uh, but uh, I would, one other thing, just to get back to this issue of, uh, you know, sort of isn't oncology depressing. The other thing for people who are new to the field is, you know, maybe it's not right for you. You know, if you feel good about it, if you're new to the field and, you, and this is the kind of direction you think could fulfill your needs, great. But, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. And I think you are different people. But, Paula, let's hear about, again, 32-year-old woman with metastatic disease. And it's interesting because metastatic, well, cervix cancer, 13 to 14,000 are diagnosed in the United States, about 4,000 die. So it's not very common, and we know that there's prevention, okay? So we don't see a lot, at least at my institution, we don't see a lot of metastatic. This is another young woman that presented to us from an outside hospital, and she presented with uh, um, blood clots, DVT, superclav node, did a biopsy, and the histology was malarian, and that's GYN, so it's not specific as to what tumor, and she had an elevated CA125, they did a CT scan, lymphadenopathy, they thought it was ovarian. So they treat her with, you know, standard of care, which would be uh, carboplatin, paclitaxel. She's 32, she's a white woman, so she didn't fit the mold in the sense that she was um, a college graduate and she played collegiate soccer, a uh, skinny little thing, and just uh, she had a monogamous boyfriend of five years. And when Dr. Love and I were speaking, he goes, well, why are you bringing that up? Because we know with the HPV, it tends to be people that have multiple factors, uh, sex partners, but we also know all due respect, it's the men that are the victor, the vector. So it's how many partners did they have? Anyway, my three minutes is already up. So she, um, she's 32. She comes from a, uh, she has seven siblings. Her mom was one of nine. She goes, 
we make babies. She goes, I want children. I am not having surgery. So again, like your young patient, um, she had children. This one was not married, but wanted to marry and wanted to have children. So infertility, we sent her to REI, the whole thing. But she presents to us after three cycles of carboplatin and, and paclitaxel. She needs to have inner debulking surgery, uh, bonds with my physician, a female, talk about, yes, I understand your need for children, but you know, birthing children doesn't make you a mom. There's other ways, blah, blah, blah. Long, long, long conversation. Anyway, she agrees to undergo surgery. Um, incredible pathologist. Turn out that there's HPV. Turns out that it's cervix cancer, not ovarian cancer. It's like, oh my gosh, she's stage four, you know, super clab, the same thing. The treatment, the carboplatin paclitaxel is fine. Uh, finishes up um, six cycles, and then she has external beam, do a CT scan, and she's got new METs. It's like, oh my gosh, this is like so not fair. So then um, we, you know, have this new drug out here, uh, tisodomab vidotin, TV is what we call it, which is something that, a new ADC that it, uh, attaches to tissue factor, which the ma majority of metastatic cervix cancer express. It attaches to that and then brings in it with a cancer-killing compound or drug, in this case, MMAE, don't ask me to pronounce it, which is like a micular tubular uh, disabler, similar, it doesn't work like paclitaxel, but you know the taxanes are a microtubular disruptor. So that brings it into the cell and then that, the payload is released and uh, kills cancer. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the simplest version. And then when I explain things to patients, usually I do a better job, but I'll have a handout and I'll ask them also, would a video, and I oftentimes will have my iPad and show a video cartoon of it because they explain it a lot better than I. So. Um, um, thank you for indulging me and not laughing at me. And so the, the side effects of this is so different than anything that we've done with chemotherapy, ocular toxicity. Now, that's not the most common. You're going to have the fatigue, you're going to have peripheral neuropathy, um, and maybe some changes in uh, blood counts, but not significant. But the ocular toxicity is like, oh my gosh, you have my attention here. So patients are not going to go blind, but there is a risk of eye damage. So these patients, as a baseline, need to see an eye specialist. Now, of course, I'm in an academic facility, so we have an eye specialist that we collaborate with. Not everybody has the luxury of that, right? So um, talking to a lot of... Uh, um, physicians and nurses across the country, they also will use your local eye specialist. So it doesn't have, it can be an ophthalmologist or an optometrist, making sure you get a baseline. The most common side effects we're going to see is more like a dry eye, redness, conjunctivitis. We're not going to see blindness, but the important thing is, and I drill this into my patients, is you need to follow the directions. So you're going to be ascribed two different eye drops, one a steroid that you're going to use the day day of treatment and also a vasoconstrictor you're going to use the day of treatment. The steroid you're going to use for three days and then a lubricant drop you're going to use four to five times all through treatment, so like every single day. And I'm texting, reminding them, bring in your eye drops. Then we also because neuropathy, so also with the dry eyes, with the eyes, we will put ice packs over their eyes and we change that out every 20 minutes. So we start it um, before treatment. The infusion is only 30 minutes, so I'll put it on a new one and then after. And it's interesting because um, you can use eye uh, cold packs. Um, there are those uh, cosmetic ones that women sometimes have for facial swelling or eye swelling um, that have gel inside. You put them in the freezer. So I had her um, buy some and bring in three of them. So we changed those out. We have dry ice and um, we kept that in the freezer to um, interchange. But if they don't have that, you can just put ice packs over it. But she did really, really well. She was a soccer player while she was getting the carboplatin and the paclitaxel. She was so tired, really poor performance status, stopped um, playing soccer. When she was getting the TV, she resumed her soccer, you know, engaging, traveling, family, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, she did really well. And then after the uh, CT scan, after third cycle, responding. Um, after the sixth cycle, she's got new lymph node um, 
superclav and also mediastinal. So now we have just put her on Pembro and um, Bevacivimab. So that was unfortunate, but again, there are still things to do. And again, we're prolonging life and hopefully with a little bit of quality of life there. So uh, just a few words about antibody uh, drug conjugates. And actually, we actually did an entire program on ophthalmic issues in oncology, because you're seeing this, a lot of the uh, drugs now, particularly antibody drug conjugates, have something at least that's gonna send them to an ophthalmologist for a checkup. But Brian, maybe you can just talk a little bit about your vision about, again, we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of these over the next few days, what an antibody drug conjugate is, and specifically what the sodomavidotin is. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And it's a really exciting agent. Um, one of the things I'll, for, I'll, I'll to highlight, the ocular mitigation strategy. Um, it seems different than other ADCs, so this isn't necessarily a class effect. Other ADCs don't have the same type of need for an ocular mitigation strategy, number one. Number two is, I was involved with the first in human studies. We didn't know what to do with the eyes. So we had a higher rate of these issues. Now that we've done the phase one, the phase two, and there's an ongoing phase three confirmatory trial, we're getting better at it. And this black box warning that the FDA has um, may be reevaluated in the future. Um, okay, specifically in ADC, three components. A kill, the poison that's going to kill the cancer cell. The linker that combines the kill with the tissue factor or the antibody target that's going to, jo the, the antigen that's going to join the tumor cell. Now what needs to happen is once the tissue factor gets attracted to and attaches to the tissue factor receptor, then it's up to the linker to let go and let the kill, the cytotoxic agent, go after the tumor cells. That's what makes it more precise. Very exciting area. Um, Neil, to your point, we have it in cervix cancer. Um, uh, there's no ovarian cancer. The, uh, in, in later in your week, you're going to talk about mervituximab. And we're also investigating an endometrial cancer as well. Um, I have a patient similar to your story, uh, Paula. Um, weak, cachectic, anasarcic. I gave her um, TV, and it's working. Um, I can't comment on the duration of response, but it's working, which is really um, exciting. It's an indication for patients with recurrent disease. It's well-tolerated. Um, future directions of this, there are some preliminary data, Paulie, um, I know you guys are on top of everything. Preliminary data in those patients that are Pembro naive, perhaps adding Pembro with the TV, two is better than one, so we're going to see that um, coming up. And as I mentioned, there's a the registration trial, which I'm leading in the U.S., looking at TV versus standard chemotherapy um, for this disease. You know, I don't know the data, I don't know the results. It's going to win. Why is it going to win? Chemotherapies don't work in a second or third line setting. So we really need agents, it's an unmet need, and it seems like with TV we have an exciting opportunity here. And we just had an approval of an antibody drug conjugate and immunotherapy in bladder cancer. So and Fortimab plus Pembrolizumab just approved as first-line therapy of metastatic bladder cancer. There's a lot more that we could say about that, but we just have a couple minutes left. I wanted to come back to you, Jennifer, and have you share a little bit more about some of the things that you uh, thought, had thoughts about your patient uh, with um, uh, small children, and what you've learned from some of your colleagues at MGH about how to manage this very difficult situation. Thank you, yes. Uh, first of all, I encourage you all to look at their website. So if you just go to the Mass General uh, uh, homepage, you can type in PACT, P-A-C-T, um, and they have a, a plethora of um, information for clinicians and patients, um, so it's, it can be really helpful. So please check that out. Um, I don't work for them. I just <laughs> really like them. Um, so a couple of things that I've learned from them throughout the years are, first of all, that um, I touched on this a little bit, but the, the concept like, you know, what the child doesn't know can't hurt them. Um, and it's all done out of love and being protective, but that can actually be quite detrimental. It can be even more scary for these kids when they don't know what's going on. So keeping, the, you know, you have to make sure it's within their developmental um, space, but keeping them in, informed and, you know, you know, mom has cervical cancer, call it by its name. Um, this is what we're doing. This is my doctor. This is their name, you know. Keeping them in the loop uh, can actually prevent anxiety and, um, and the scariness associated with going to the hospital. Um, another thing is um, 
the worst way for a child to hear about a diagnosis or something going wrong is to overhear it. So again, just being upfront with them, um, you know, they could hear from a caregiver or a teacher, they overhear something, it can be incredibly scary and they could just kind of, you know, um, retreat and, and um, not want to engage. And then um, lastly, and I thought this was sort of interesting. Another just kind of protective thing, patients don't think to bring their kids to appointments, um, but it actually can be quite helpful. So if you bring the child, let them see who's taking care of them, you know, sort of what mom's going through, um, but make sure you have a caregiver there that can, you know, keep it to, you know, 20 minutes or whatever the developmental level is. Um, that can be really helpful. And then to, to come back to it later at a good time, maybe during dinner or bath time, like, hey, you know, you saw a mom today in the hospital, um, what did you think about that? Or did you have any questions about it? That sort of thing. So I'll leave you with that, but check out that website. It's really, really helpful. So um, anything about the issue of sort of meeting the child at their own level, you know, the three-year-old versus the eight-year-old versus the 13-year-old? I, I, you know, I'm definitely not a child expert at all, but I, I think um, just the language you use um, and then how, how it's presented. Um, but across developmental stages, um, you want to make sure it's in a safe space. So um, wherever you have those conversations, maybe before bedtime or at dinner in the car is another good way to bring something up. Um, they can't run away from you there. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's all I have on that. So not an easy task, but one that really could have tremendous impact, not only on the patient, but their family for a long time. Thanks so much to our faculty. Thank you for attending. Coming back tonight, uh, we're going to talk about breast cancer, 6 p.m. tonight. Lots to talk about there. And hey, we're playing the Beatles tonight.